What's going on YouTube? Welcome to another, another live painting session. Today we are going to continue this Rembrandt master study that we started, I don't know how many streams ago, but this might be the last one. I'm, I'm not sure. This might be the last one that we work on this before we start another one. Uh, so today I want to talk about finding form with freedom. Now this is something that, just like many things in art that I've already spoken about, uh, before because I tend to repeat myself a lot but that's good for anyone that might be new to these uh, videos finding form with freedom and what does that entail so uh, finding form with freedom is something that I've been trying to work on a lot more recently in the past like three weeks two or three weeks um, and essentially what it means is that as soon as you learn something, and it's it's not just with painting, but um, hey Stephanie, uh, as soon as you learn something like a language, or like if you're learning linear algebra, or if you're learning calculus, or whatever, um, whatever you're learning, you grasp it. You really grasp it when you don't think about it anymore. Uh, you really grasp something when you don't think about it anymore. So um, right now what I'm doing is I'm oiling out the painting because uh, I want to work on the painting with the values as true as possible, the values and the colors. So I'm just adding Neil McGill medium to this. So um, what I mean by when you're not thinking about it anymore is it becomes intuitive. And in art, especially classical or realist painting, whatever you want to call it, painting where you paint something to look like something, which is what we're trying to do here. You internalize a lot of stuff. The first thing you really should internalize is shapes, working with shapes. That's the biggest thing that you want to internalize first. If you're not comfortable working with shapes, that's the beginning. That's where you want to start, and that has to do with drawing. Uh, not so much with painting, but I consider drawing and painting to be the same thing, uh, because um, when, when you're painting, you're just drawing with color. So I don't really differentiate painting and drawing at all. But um, working with shapes is the biggest thing, and that's something that I encourage right away in the online classes that I teach and when I teach in person which by the way uh, anyone that's in the Maryland area if you're watching this as the video just came out as this video just came out there's currently still spots available uh, to take classes with me in uh, the Glen Echo area of Maryland if you're interested just let me know in the comments um, I will post something about it on the uh, on the YouTube community section or just feel free to ask me about it I'll, I'll let you know anyway uh, back to the painting I'm oiling this out in spots that have sunken in to the point where um, it's too sunken in so I need to make sure that the painting will be ready for photography after this sitting and this is just gonna be a sketch so I'm not too worried about it being uh, perfectly um, you know, like a, a perfect representation of the original Rembrandt. But anyway, I'm talking a lot, so in case anyone is watching this live, uh, please feel free to ask any art-related questions, and I will begin mixing color very soon. And I've got another thing to talk about with color, uh, which is fairly new to me. Um, we'll get into that stuff in a little bit. So. I will raise the light sensitivity so you can see the difference uh, when you oil it out. So, see, that got darker because of the medium. Now, there's some spots in here, and particularly in the background, that I don't want to oil out, and that's because I don't want them to be shiny. So, when you oil it out, things get shiny. And um, if I want to photograph this after this uh, session, we'll see how far I get. But um, if I want to photograph this after this painting session, it might help me if this is still sunken in and not shiny.
So in case anyone has any art related questions or you just want to say hello, definitely feel free to, to uh, say hi. Alright, so now we're going to get to the main topic of finding form with freedom and uh, what does that entail. So first, you need to be able to find shapes with freedom. So you need to be able to find shapes with freedom, value with freedom. You need to be able to find all of the prerequisite stuff with freedom first. And that's going to take a long time, a lot of practice. Hey, Bean Pot. Hi, Janice. It's going to take a lot of practice, um, but you can do it. You can improve with your uh, painting proficiency to the point where you find form with freedom. Finding form with freedom is where I'm at currently. If, in case you're wondering of my skill level with painting, what I think my skill level is with painting, it's finding form with freedom. And finding form with freedom is a phrase that I'm taking from Nelson Shanks, my superhero in, um, in art. I've, I asked his son a little while ago if I can use... So he updated his... Wait, well, he passed away, but they updated his website, so there's some more images there. I want to use some like this for references, but I'm still waiting back to hear from his son, Alex. Um, so... Finding form with freedom, Nelson Shanks would say, and I'm going to describe exactly what that is because I think that that's the skill level where I'm at. That's the gap that I need to overcome as a painter, and I'm going to explain that to you. Hey, John. Thanks for watching from... Uh, uh, I can't pronounce that one. Tanzania? I, I can't pronounce anything, but thanks for watching. Hey Shabu, thanks for watching from India. Yeah, definitely feel free to say hi everyone. Let me know that you're here as I get into this long-winded discussion of finding form with freedom. Hey Shabu, I'm good. I've actually been painting a lot more recently. Um, I think I got my painting uh, mojo back, <laughs> so to speak. My uh, I, I went through a little rut for a while, as many of us do. Um, it was hard for me to find motivation to paint for a long period of time. And I finally got it back like a couple weeks ago. And um, I'm to the point now where I'm painting probably like more than eight hours a day. Uh, painting, 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 painting. If you want proof, <laughs> look at this mess. I haven't cleaned this. I've just been painting, 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 painting. Um, and I've got specifically some paintings that I'm working on that I haven't shown. But I'm inspired again. And uh, part of that inspiration is finding form with freedom. So what that means is that the finishing stuff, uh, to, to summarize it really quickly, the finishing stuff, like to get like a super smooth finish or a really fine form, uh, really fine color relationship to do that without thinking about it it's insanely complicated to uh to describe and to get to that point and um it's the only way to get there i think is through the hours that you spend painting and a ridiculous amount of hours i mean like eight hours ten hours a day I've, I've recently switched to nocturnal so i'm actually painting throughout the night so i'm painting uh until about 4 a.m for the past couple days um and it's actually suiting me better because there's less distraction there's less noise um i'm free to basically paint at my own will and it's the best I think experience I've had painting in a long time. Hey Rose, um, when was the first video of this painting and where can you find it? So in the description box of the video I have, hopefully, let me double check it, uh, I should have a playlist. Um, live oil painting sessions on Facebook. Let's see, reference. Hmm, where is it? 
All right, so I have a live oil painting playlist. Uh, if somebody wants to copy and paste it for me, because you know my internet tends to be kind of kind of funky when I do multiple things. But I have a playlist that has these live oil painting sessions uh, successively from like the older ones to the newer ones. I add each one of these to that playlist. I can't believe it's not in the description box. You could actually go to my YouTube channel and scroll the past, I think, three uploads have only been with this one so that would be the easiest way to find it right now but i do have a playlist for the older one hey susan um what do you use to oil uh oil out a canvas i this time i used neo mcgilp medium the medium that i like to use the gel like medium but but um uh, if i'm working on a painting for a long period of time i will oil it out with uh, a mixture of 50-50 cold press linseed oil and um, spike lavender oil and I'll put it in a little container, a dripper like this, and I'll drip it onto the surface um, and then smush it in with a sponge. But I'm not working on this one that long so it's not going to need that uh, that treatment to it. In case anyone's curious about what oiling out means, Oiling out means you're adding oil to your surface. You're oiling it out. That's what it means. Um, and you could use a medium, whatever medium you want. Uh, you can use liquid. You can use Neil McGill. You can use straight linseed oil. Never, ever, 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 ever use straight stand oil for anything. If you're going to use stand oil, um, mix it with solvent first so that it's fluid. Stand oil itself is just kind of gunky, and I would not recommend uh, using it by itself. Uh, and all it does is it brings back the luminosity that the painting had when it was wet, and it allows you to work on a layer of medium so you don't have to add any extra medium. And it helps the paint glide a little bit more, especially if you're in the finishing stuff. So um, with this painting, I'm trying to get to a point with my painting where I'm not pausing and standing back and thinking too much because I do want to stand back so I can see the painting with less uh, you know like less tunnel vision so when you're looking when you're working like this you can't quite uh, see the whole painting you can't see it as a whole as when you're standing back. So that's the first thing you want to always be able to stand back or sit back if you can't stand and then sit back, that's fine. Um, but I want to get to a point in painting and I'm working really hard towards that right now. That's like one of my biggest goals uh, as a painter is to be able to not think but react uh, when I'm painting. Not think but react. I've done hundreds, I feel like hundreds of hundreds of paintings where I've gotten to this level and beyond very actively. I've had to really think very hard uh, about it and it is something that you have to do. You have to do. You have to think through it. Uh, you have to think about light and shadow. You have to think about form. You have to think about all of the fundamentals. But you get to a point in painting where you're enjoying the ease of it. It becomes easy. So what you're doing is feeling out uh, the process. You become, the process becomes so natural to you that it is effortless. And when it becomes effortless, you sing. You, be you begin to sing in your paintings. You're no longer following a very careful script anymore but it just flows uh, and I think that very few painters get to that point because there's so much anxiety involved in uh, realist art it's so much anxiety but you get to a level where you let go let go 
and this happens with everything to me this happened with color years ago it happened with shape for me years ago uh, it happened with um, values years ago but it has not happened with form because i'm scared it, it actually scares me to get to a point in painting where things are starting to become very realistic and i'm i stop i pause and i have this bad tendency of overthinking it and um, a lot of painters have this anxiety this fear uh, when they get to this point because it takes so long to get to this point in a painting that you don't want to mess it up uh, or as a streamer like as a video creator like i've been creating videos forever i am getting to a point now with video where i don't have that fear that i'm going to say something dumb and uh, get uh, ridiculed for it because i just stopped caring because i do these videos twice a week for my online classes consistently i've been doing that for years now for like three years now or something like that i don't even know how long it's been um so that consistency has liberated me from the fear of uh, messing up saying something silly and and ruining it hey he bought, uh let's see how can I do a grayscale? Oh, thank you for the compliment. How can I do a grayscale to paint the dead layer without a value finder? So the best way is to organize your values in terms of the basic sphere, basic circle. So light and shadow is first, two tones. Introduce an accent, that's three tones. Introduce a middle tone, that's four tones. Introduce a highlight, that's five tones. Quite simply, light, shadow, two tones. Accent is the areas that are the darkest darks. Three tones. Middle tones next to your shadow here, here, and here. That becomes four tones. Highlight, five tones. Ignore the rest. That's how you can organize it uh, more easily without having to do a grayscale or using a value finder. Hey, Jonas. Uh, let's see, a fun quiz to everyone. Do you know the difference between a main, uh, what? A man-made shadow that you see from the house versus a natural shadow? Sounds like a trick question. Man-made shadow that you see from a house versus a natural shadow. I'm going to let everyone... <laughs> I'm going to let somebody else answer that. I feel like that's a trick question. I can guess that it's a form shadow versus a cast shadow. Um, a cast shadow is like this. A shadow that's casted. Um, a natural shadow would be like a shadow on the form. So like the shadow on my hand. So this is a form shadow here. This is a cast shadow, so this is a projected shadow. But I don't know if there's such a thing as a man-made shadow. I feel like there's a joke coming here, I just don't know what it is. So you want to get to a point in painting where every stage, every step involves freedom. Now there are some techniques that will not allow you to achieve uh, freedom as easily um, and and one of them is the classical approach ironically that's the way that i teach students from the get-go from the beginning now from the beginning you want to think through everything because everything is so new to you um, so finding form with freedom is not what you're thinking about in the beginning instead what you're thinking about is finding shapes with freedom you need to learn how to find shapes with freedom and that's what you learn with the classical method because you're you're drawing everything out so carefully you're not worried about form and then you get to the point where you're doing the fine finishing stuff and there's a lot of form involved in it 
and then you've really got to think analytically through it. But uh, to find form with freedom, working this way is one of the easier ways to do it because everything is out in the open. But it's harder to control. It's so easy for things to slip out of uh, control. And that's why I'm doing, um, that's why I started this way so loosely before the first video was very loose. And even this Rembrandt, this painting is attributed to Rembrandt, but we can't really know if it is an original Rembrandt or not. Um, we can't really know if he painted it, but looking at this painting, you can tell that whoever did it had a sense of freedom in their uh, method, in their, in their mindset. There was a sense of freedom, a, a liberation of sorts. And many painters alive today have that sense of freedom, but, but some of them still hold on to this tightness um, when they're working. And some of it has to do, I think, with personality, really, because um, even Bouguereau, oh, let's see, Jonas, that is a good explanation of it. Yes, like a man-made shadow from a house uh, have hard, straight edges. Oh, okay. You know, there's, uh, for example, like on a form, you're going to find both form shadow and cast shadow. So uh, there's a form shadow here, but now there's a cast shadow there from the nose projecting a shadow here. So you can have both of them in the same uh, same place. Hey, Hebler, can you have a tutorial about it with an example? About what? Because I was talking about many things. <laughs> I tend to do that. Uh, I'm so passionate about art. I'm just all over the place with it. Um, but you mean the shadow discussion or finding shapes with freedom? And I finally, finally have Viridian back. Uh, Viridian is one of my favorite colors. See, there I go running circles. <laughs> running circles. Because this is live, so if there's something that you want me to clarify, I can do it here. Much faster than making a tutorial about it. So remember, anyone watching this as a pre-recorded video in the future, these are live painting sessions, so I'm able to answer your questions right on the spot, like right away. So long as my internet is working, I can answer your questions right away. Uh, let's see. So, Jonas, you mean hard straight edges versus shadows? Okay, so let's let's just categorize um, forms. I mean, shadows in just two categories: cast shadow and form shadow. That's how it was taught to me, so that's how I'll do it. Um, hey, Leon. Leon. Yeah, Viridian is the best. I'm so glad I have it back. I hate using any other green uh, other than Viridian. Um, cast shadow versus form shadow. This is a cast shadow, a shadow that's casted from something. And yes, it tends to have a sharper edge, as you see there. But then it has something called a penumbra, which means that it gets softer and softer and softer as it gets further away from the where the shadow has been casted. This occurs naturally. Um, so here you have a, um, let's say, okay, so I'm using my hand as a reference. Okay, so there's a shadow casted from one finger onto the other finger. Do you see how sharp that edge is? That's a sharp edge. Cast shadows tend to have sharper edges. Form shadow, there's one right here on my hand. They tend to have softer edges. There's one right there. This is a form shadow, yet this is a cast shadow because it's being casted from the knuckle. And that can happen here 
Um, this is a form shadow, so it has a very soft transition from here to here. However, here there's a recess that's a harder edge because this is a cast shadow because it's being casted from the light uh, being the light that's blocked from the eyebrow ridge, the brow ridge. So that is cast shadow sharper, form shadow softer, form shadow softer, cast shadow sharper because that's being casted from the nose. The nose also just has a sharper edge to it anyway. Form shadow here which is still too sharp because I'm st I'm just getting to it. Form shadow here, cast shadow here because it's being casted from the cheek and the mustache area right there. Hey Heba, what do you think about talent paints? I've never heard of it. Talent paints, never heard of them. Uh, so I don't know, I don't really have a opinion about them. Hey Heba, the grayscale without a value finder, you mean for the dead layer? Mm. Oh, thanks, Jonas. I'm glad you liked the explanation. Let me think. A dead layer usually means underpainting to me. Um, but without a value finder, I would... The last time I used a value finder was probably, like, 2007. I feel like... Or not... I wasn't even painting then. Probably, like, 2008. Um, so... Let me think. I'd say the best thing to do is to categorize, as I mentioned before, is to categorize your values based on the the sphere, the generic sphere. Light and shadow, dark light, accent, and then highlight. Hey Leon, uh, yes, I'm using lead white, also known as creminence white, also known as flake white, also known as lead white. Um, many different names for the same thing, uh, but yes, this is a lead-based white, and um, I could easily use titanium too. My titanium is sitting right up, up top, and actually, on my palette, my studio palette that I've been using for days um, a lot of the lights here are titanium white this is titanium white this is lead white so the titanium white actually helps to activate uh, brighter tones um, so in somewhere around the middle here I tend to use more uh, lead white so um, one thing to mention I have now begun to make my own paints. So this is a new thing uh, relative to what you're used to. I have now begun making my own paints. So I'm, I'm buying the pigments. Uh, I'm using Gamblin pigments, but pigments are pigments. Um, yes, some pigments are different than others, even with the same pigment number. Uh, but I'm starting to make my own paints. This cadmium red medium, I made it with uh, Gamblin cadmium red medium pigment and uh, Chelsea Classical Studio uh, cold press, extra pale cold press linseed oil. I've also made the Viridian. So I've made the cadmium red and the Viridian, and I make them as I go. I do not recommend anyone do this. Um, so I don't recommend you make your own paints unless you're working full time. If you're painting full time and you go through a lot of expensive paint really fast, do not make your own paint. It's not worth the risk because uh, you can accidentally inhale the uh, pigment particle. If you accidentally inhale the pigment, that's the worst thing you can do. Don't do it unless you absolutely have to. Uh, and you'll you'll hear other painters tell you different things, but I'm interested in your safety. Don't mess with it. 
uh, if you don't have to. But I will talk about it because I actually really like <laughs> I really like the paints that I mixed on my own. Uh, let's see. In Europe, you don't have it. Titanium is the most dominant. Oh, okay. So, um, I will also be buying um, a lifetime supply of lead white pigment because I feel like that might happen in the US. They might ban it. If they ban it, I'll have enough pigment for the rest of my life, hopefully. Um, so, that is a possibility. However, you can get by just fine with never using lead white. You don't need it. Um, it's just a luxury to have. It's not a necessity. Yes, I'm using uh, linseed for Viridian. I'm not using safflower. Oh, you, you buy the, I don't know how to pronounce it, but cool. Uh, Susan, what do I use to oil oil out a painting in between layers? In the earlier stages, I use Neo Megilp, Neo Megilp uh, medium. The later stages, I use half solvent, which the solvent I choose to use is cold press linseed oil, and half. Um, no, 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 I got it backwards. I use half solvent, which is spike lavender oil so that's what i use you could use um mineral spirits if you want to instead of um instead of my head's getting all mixed up instead of spike lavender you can use gamsol for example uh, and cold pressed linseed oil So this cadmium red is my absolute favorite. Uh, and if you want to use a cadmium red like this, uh, just buy Gamblin cadmium red medium. It is so much nicer than the old Holland. Um, the old Holland, what was it? Um, cadmium red deep, that's what I used to use. But it was a little too dark, a little too dark. So um, I like it. And uh, I've tried cadmium red light from old Holland. I've tried cadmium red light from pretty much every other brand um, this one is my favorite and I mixed it myself uh, but you can get something equivalent to it if you buy uh, gambling cadmium red medium okay the next thing is going to be uh, the dark that I mix and um, I mix it on my own with different paints. So I've been painting so much that I bristle is starting to feel like a stone. Uh, so I use Iridian, Alizarin Crimson on their own. Look how dark that is. That's what I'm saying. Viridian is so amazing. It's versatile, both for the darks and for the lights. Uh, it's it's so useful. It was a pain to use um, any other green to try to make a dark because I had to use so much of it. So I'm starting to do that thing where I'm thinking too much. So instead I'm trying to, like I said, react to the paint and feel out the form in order to find form with freedom. And when you're able to find form with freedom, the process in theory should become so much more fun. For me, it's a matter of not worrying, eliminating the anxiety.
Oh, good. Yay for all Viridian uh, appreciators out there. Notice how much I use it. Like, I, I just keep going right to it. For darks and for lights. Now I'm going to give you advice, give everyone advice in order to get on the road towards finding form with freedom. And that is going to be, think about it this way. Everything that you do in life, everything that you learn, whether it's cooking, playing pool, um, speaking foreign languages, or whatever you do, uh, the learning process is such that you get out of your head. Um, not in the sense that you lose your mind, but you learn to relax. You learn to relax and you don't think about it anymore. It's like when you speak. Uh, sometimes we have to think about our grammar. For example, as children, or if we're just learning a language or something like that, we have to think about our grammar, right? And then somehow we stop thinking about the grammar it's like when you're in your own mind you're thinking in your own native language your own native tongue or whatever it is just internalized everything that you learn you internalize it to some extent um, to some extent some of you are doctors some of you are lawyers some of you are teachers but you are professionals in what you do so finding form with freedom being able to do this without thinking about it is a form of professionalism in in art because you're very proficient at what you're um, aiming to do to the point where it is a natural Progression. Now, I'm not saying that it's always going to be like that. Even the greatest of the greats, like Bouguereau and Nelson Shanks and Rembrandt, even though they knew how to find form with freedom very efficiently, quickly, I can guarantee you they got into some trouble with some paintings where they had to stop and think about it or go get a a cup of coffee or a, a cup of tea or something and return to the painting and think about it. Especially Sargent. John Singer Sargent uh, was known to uh, curse at his paintings and get really frustrated. Um, and it's kind of like a personality thing too sometimes, but you get to a point where most of it is automatic. Most of it is automatic. And you're combining both your mind your, and your heart with the process. And that's when it comes really poetic. It becomes really poetic. Hey, Leon, you appreciate both methods. I freestyle my paintings, but nowadays I plan, nowadays I plan compositions to minute details. Both method, methods are valuable, especially in combination. Exactly. Perfect. I couldn't have said that any better myself. It is having the control of both the free method, working very freely with shapes. Um, they all involve shapes, but working very freely in combination with a tighter approach, a more controlled method. Absolutely agree. Because I've noticed, I've noticed a lot of artists uh, that studied in the same style that I did. Um, it was all about the freedom. It was all about the looseness. But they never got past that. They never got to the 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 rendering, the fine finishing stuff. Um, they never got there because it was always about that loose, energetic start 
and they never really learned how to describe things. To this day, there's some painters that, um, I mean, everyone's at a different place, right? But there's some painters that just did not get past the beginning, the basic building blocks. Because there's some, they have so much fun in the beginning stuff. And I personally don't like the starts as much as I like the middle stages and the finishing stages these days. Um, so it's a balance, really. In the online classes I have, um, on Saturdays now, we're doing quick sketches. Uh, quick drawings. You can see those drawings on my Instagram. Cobalt blue is a really nice color to use, by the way. But, but anyway, um, I have a combination of both long-term stuff and short-term stuff. And you need to have a, uh, find a happy medium, a happy middle ground. So, uh, so Leon, I couldn't have said that any better. And it's such a hard thing to talk about, uh, this finding form of freedom thing. And it's best to simplify everything in life, I feel like. Painting is no exception. To put it simply, you know, like that grand unification of uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity, that grand unification that Einstein was looking for, uh, which nowadays is thought to be string theory, but um, let's try to simplify everything that we talk about. And finding form with freedom, the best simplicity I can think of is to react so to react to the painting it's so natural it's so instinctive to you that what you do now is react for those of you that have uh i don't know if anyone here is a dragon ball z fan um i am because i grew up in the 90s any dragon ball z fans here someone i hope <laughs> i mean this might not be the crowd for that but um Dragon Ball Z, the ultimate form that Goku has, the main character uh, in Dragon Ball Super, is Ultra Instinct. At least that's what we think the natural, the strongest form is. A hippie artist. And, um, and that's the point where the character, the main character, doesn't think anymore about how he fights. He just reacts. And since that's why it's called ultra instinct so we're trying to reach an ultra instinct form uh hey hippie artist your kid was okay cool so we're, we're trying to um at least i know someone out there was into a uh, dragon ball z so we're trying to get to a point where it's like ultra instinct where it's instinct maybe that's a better term maybe i should just steal that term from dragon ball z Ultra instinct in painting is where you're just reacting. It's such a beautiful thing. You're just reacting. And it's so hard to get to that point. I'll let you know when I get there. Funny, Dragon Ball Z was one of the first things I used to draw when I was a kid in elementary school. I would draw the characters and sell them for a dollar. <laughs> I'm ashamed to say this, but I, yeah, I used to do little drawings um, when I was in elementary school and I would sell them for a dollar to, uh, I don't know, it was just fun. A little bit of nostalgia there. And it's a mastery through repetition of 
of the proper methods. Mastery through repetition of the correct methods. You need the right teaching first. You're not going to self-teach yourself the correct methods because none of us are going to just happen upon what the correct methods are. Unless, I guess, YouTube, right? I'm here for you. Um, use YouTube. Use all the, all of the resources that you can possibly get to teach you. The correct methods and then just practice them as much as you can oh yeah yeah hip you already see i was in the in the pokemon too when i was a kid i um i remember going to the movie theaters in the year 2000 to watch uh, pokemon the movie 2000 22 years ago now But we should always be a kid at heart. You should never grow out of your kid stage. You should always be a kid. And maybe that's one of the things that keeps us from from learning. You ever you ever just marvel at how fast children learn things? I mean a lot of it has to do with like neuroscience, right? Because neuroplasticity, but a lot of it is that they just have fun. They don't think about what others are going to think about them when they're that young. They're just enjoying life. Being in the moment. And painting should be like that. It really should. And I really wish that for you all. I'm here for you. Like I said, you don't have to pay for these streams. You can tip me if you want to. That's, that's cool. But... Um, just learn through watching. Look at what I'm doing and recreate it yourself. And of course, if you want to go further, then you know what to do. So right now I'm trying, like I'm closing my eyes to just feel out what I'm doing. And notice how frequently I stand back. I'm standing back to make my decisions. Make your decisions standing back. It's so important to practice that. That's one of those fundamental things. You have to learn to stand back or sit back. All right, so let's um, introduce a crowd question. I think I've just been talking at you so much. Um, so what is currently on your easel? You know what's on my easel. What is currently on your easel? Nothing is a valid answer. But hopefully we'll change that after this stream. A hippie artist who never did master studies, we did more of our own art in the BFA program. Oh, cool, where did you go? And also, what's on your easel? A bean pot, you're trying to paint a boy playing doctor with his teddy bear. Awesome. Very good narrative painting.
I hate the artist. Only because that's the only college in Vegas. Wow. Oh, cool. Well, I'm glad you sent it to me. So uh, I will be filming the virtual classroom after this stream. So uh, students, online students on Patreon, you'll you'll get the video probably about an hour or less after this stream ends. So Lloyd, Portrait of a Woman, reference by Stephen Bauman. Oh, cool. Oh, there goes my camera. So I must emphasize this, that the old masters, the masters were not born able to do what they're doing. They weren't born with the skill set uh, necessary to paint the way that they did. Therefore, everything that they did, they had to learn it from somewhere. Uh, which is an obvious thing to most, but I I want to always state the fact that this is all learnable stuff. One thing Nelson said, a Nelson Shanks quote, somebody asked, "Is this learnable stuff, or is it, or is there just something innate to uh, artists that enable them to do what they do, something like that?" And uh, Nelson said, "It's all uh, it's all learnable stuff. It just depends on." who were trying to stuff with the knowables. Uh, Nelson Shanks quote. And you can tell I'm a lot more animated now about painting than I was even last week. So excited. And the best part is I'll be teaching in person soon, next week. Next week I start teaching at a new school for me in uh, Glen Echo, Maryland. There's still some spots available. Alright, so I'm going to stand back again. I'd say we're almost there. Almost to a point where I can photograph this. The next time we'll start a new one. I know most viewers tend to like the starts. Hey, Hyman. Oh, thank you. Oh, thanks, hippie artist. 
Though I can't uh, say for certain if I'll make it tomorrow. I'm I'm meeting with uh, uh, my uh, billiards instructor, which I haven't even had the time to practice. So <laughs> he's, he's probably going to quit on me, but um, very likely Thursday. We'll start a new one. But if you're subscribed to the channel and you have the notifications, it should let you know. So again, I'm trying to just react. Take deep breaths, relax, react. One of my uh, favorite teachers, her name is Robin Fry. Uh, Fry spelled F R E Y. Would tell me that that you can tell you can always tell when somebody enjoyed what they were painting and then you can tell when they didn't and he was she she was specifically referring to um commissions like if you look at a lot of sergeant commissions you can tell he was just trying to get it finished but if you look at some of sergeant's landscapes uh you can definitely tell that was sergeant was into whatever subject he was painting there and some of his sketches of his friends, uh, you can tell Sargent was very much more happy when he was painting that. And a lot of this process to build a painting this way is working from the inside out. Notice I'm working from all the in interior shapes and forms and building them that way. Finding form with freedom, not even thinking about this is the bottom of the orbicularis orus. It needs to, this valley needs to be darker because there's less ambient light hitting right underneath of this shape. It's internalized at this point. It's internalized. And I'm not simply just looking at it and copying it. I understand the form, I understand the basics, and I'm just running with it. However, as a as a painting demonstrator here on YouTube, most of the time I'm explaining it to you in that way. You know, this edge needs to pull in because it was pulling out a little too far. The edge was too sharp. It was drawing too much attention to itself. All of these things go on in my mind, but at this point, I'm trying to, like I said, not think about them as heavily as I once did. For example, this needs to get darker because this 
accent in general needs to pull away. Now I'm not putting straight black. I'm just putting something slightly darker. And if you ever you ever walk up to a really good painting, uh, representational like realist painting, and it looks so realistic from a distance, and then you walk up close to it, and there's just little pieces of paint that are seemingly random, and you wonder how that's done, how how painters do that. Sargent was one of the most famous. Uh, uh, painters and Velasquez, of course, uh, and Rembrandt. I mean, pretty much all of them. Even Bouguereau. If you walk up, if you look up close to a Bouguereau, you'll you'll see he doesn't even paint toenails. Uh, it's crazy. The number one uh, piece of advice I can give you towards having that effect in your paintings is. Stay further back. Stay as far back as you can. That's the first thing I teach my students in person. Uh, when I'm teaching an in-person class, the first thing I do, I call it the stance. I teach the stance. It's almost like you're jousting, almost like you're a, a sword fighter. That active energy response to the painting is the first step. Literally, it's a step because you're stepping, right? <laughs> Now I'm remixing a similar value, similar color, just a tad bit darker. So you always want to work in relationships. And like I said, I'm trying to internalize it, make it be like ultra instinct for me. But um, I'm internalizing it, but I'm explaining it to you as I go. So I'm making this darker and a little bit more green. So it pulls away. Notice how I do that. Sometimes I'll pull my glasses down so I can see a blurred version of the painting. And I see that there's probably some reds I need to add. So I'm going to go back to pushing the uh, accent a little bit for the lower eyelid. Now I'm going to mix those warmer colors. It could also be my screen, I'm not sure, but let's see some warmer colors. So that one, I think that's cadmium orange. Oh no, that's cadmium red vermilion. Um, sometimes I'll throw a bunch of colors on there. But you could easily get this with um, cadmium red and a touch of yellow and maybe some yellow ochre to kill it off a little bit.
All right, so the chat's been kind of quiet, so I'm going to ask another question for everyone. The question is, who is your favorite artist? Uh, visual artist, let's just say. Your favorite visual artist. Of course, you know mine, I always say, is my superhero, Nelson Shanks. Pushing a little more warmth. I'm blurring my eyes to see the color. That's why I'm moving my head down like that. I'm nearsighted, so I have to move my glasses down to blur the image. Is there anybody out there? Hippie artist, me, oh wow, <laughs> meaning you as me as you, I see, I like the confidence, don't think I have that much confidence. A oh, drawer, awesome. I heard he was the first superhero in the art world, like first superstar drawer. And he got to enjoy his fame in his lifetime too. Pretty rare. Yeah, he was very good, exceptional.
Hey, John. I'm glad you uh, caught the live stream. It was great seeing you on Zoom an hour or so ago. I'm pushing this dark a little bit. There's a little more form there. Sometimes you need to add a sharper edge. Oh, no worries, John. We'll be on Zoom again on Friday. And then next Tuesday. A hippie artist in the final touches. Is it more highlights and reds? Oh, let's see. Yeah, I'm adding warmer colors, but very sparingly, not all over the place. Um, and it's more so I'm touching up this shadow, this form. This is a cast shadow on his cheek from his hair. But yeah, somewhat. Um, Highlights and reds, but it's all around the form. So I didn't quite explain too much. I didn't do a good job of explaining what I was doing because I was trying to demonstrate the uh, intuitive aspect of painting or finding form with freedom. And I think I'm almost there, really. I don't have to think as much through it. But... Um, it's all about pushing the form, getting this to be more dimensional, uh, even more dimensional than the picture that you're seeing there because I have more control over the value range. The picture flattens it out. Um, though to you, it might look flat also because you're looking at it through a screen. But the final, final touches are more form-based with this one. Sometimes it's more aesthetics-based. Uh, like if you're working on a complicated painting with uh, reptiles in it and mountains and skulls and things like what I'm working on, um, then it's more about the aesthetics, uh, trying to get things to fit the story. I'm pushing this dark for the eyebrow because I want that to be lighter, this to be darker as it pushes away. And the angle for his nose in here pushes in a little more. And see how I've been working kind of all around. Sometimes, like last time, I, I, I'll spend a lot more time in one spot. 
this time I was moving all around. That's why I oiled out the painting in the beginning. I didn't notice the time. We've gone past, far past the time. But I think that's good. All right, I'm going to move the camera so you can see it with less distortion. And this will be the part of the stream where I ask if there are any last minute questions. And as I do that, I'll talk about my online classes as I usually do at this point. So we'll have a little talk about my online classes and then uh, I guess that will be it. So um, the online classes start at just $10 a month and you have access to all of the pre-recorded lessons and you're able to send me up to two images of your artworks for uh, three pointers per image and you can do this every single week you're all, you're able to you don't have to send images each week and you're able to work at your own pace that starts at the ten dollars a month uh, beyond the ten dollars a month there are other benefits such as painting with me on zoom and uh, more information is listed in the description box of the video where you can click on to the link to my patreon and on my patreon there are detailed descriptions of each tier so once again starting at ten dollars a month you have access to all of the pre-recorded uh, videos i upload two lessons a week one behind the scenes and one virtual classroom so uh let's see if there are any last minute questions uh, from Rose, where did I go to art school? So I studied in Baltimore with an artist named Holden Hamilton. That's most of my art education comes from uh, painting with Holden Hamilton. But I studied with various other artists. Uh, that was at the school called Zoll Studio of Fine Art in uh, Timonium, Maryland. But I also attended a school in Philadelphia called Studio in Caminati where I lived with one of the instructors and one of the students there uh, for one year. And I did the uh, first year of their four-year program uh, at Studio in Kamenati. This was like 2000, I think, 11, 2011-ish, something around that time, that time period. And there I studied with numerous artists, many artists. Um, and since then, I've studied with a uh, bunch of other artists that have helped me out a lot. Okay, so it looks like there are no last minute questions. At least I don't think. I don't see them on here. I'll give it just one more minute. Okay, so I'm not seeing any 
extra questions. So I will very likely return, if not tomorrow, which is a Wednesday, um, we'll probably be back Thursday. Remember my streaming schedule, at least these days, is uh, between Tuesday and Friday around 2.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. I cannot guarantee that I will stream every single day, but that's the most likely time frame that you will see me streaming here on YouTube. So once again, thank you all so much for watching. I wish you the very best in all of your work, and I'll see you on the next one.